Hello and welcome to episode 75 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at Andrew RLP. And joining me as always is League Freak, who you can find on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? I'm very good. How are you, Andrew? Not too bad. Not too bad. What's going on? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Setting no. the groundwork for a stellar podcast right here. Yeah. No, I actually just finished watching the uh, South Sydney versus Sydney Roosters match, and it was a really good one. Really strange. They beat the hell out of each other when there was really nothing on the line to beat the hell out of each other for. Yeah, it's um, it was fascinating viewing. And there's a very strong possibility that we might get to see this exact same game next week. Yeah, well, I think it, it means that the Warriors have to beat the Raiders for that to happen. Yeah. Which is a very, very long shot when you consider but that the Raiders... Canberra have, the Canberra have rested quite a few players for that game, though. Oh, have they? I didn't know that. Mm. Oh, yeah, they have. Wow. I mean, I'd like to see it again. Absolutely. Yeah. Two so, sides just bashing the crap out of one another. Yeah, it was a weird game. Like, early on, South didn't... Like, South had a lot of ball. But, like, in the first half, by the end of the first half, Rooster leading 10 points to two, and it just looked like South were out of the contest at that point. And... But, yeah, they had a fantastic second half. And, um... Two, I, tries, I guess, two tries in about three minutes got them, in, got them the lead. Yeah, they just went on a rampage. It was really cool to see. Um... And, yeah, they started throwing the ball around, too. I think that they weren't clicking all the time in the middle of the field. But when they did, they were opening the roosters wide up. Like, it was it was kind of crazy to see. It was, yeah. It's, uh, mind you, there was a, a few, quite a few head knocks and concussions to come out of it. Yeah. Um, a few players that got busted open. And Jared Maria Hargraves got put on report for... A tackle, and the only reason why he got put on reports because somebody got knocked out, got a nasty cut, and had to get taken off. That's all yeah. I can make of it. Like the actual tackle itself, he had his arm down by his side mm-hmm. when he made the tackle, so he's not swinging it high or carelessly. No, nah. and he hit hit the player in the side of his head, mm-hmm. and the player's head has bounced off a Roosters player on the other side. So it's kind of a ricochet type effect. Yeah. And that's what cut him open. It wasn't actually Maria Hargrove's hit. It was the head clash on the other side of his head that caused the, the blood to come out. Yeah, and he was sick and sorry on the ground. And I think the fact mm. that, like, just from the camera angle, it was like he was completely out for a moment and he's lying there and he's bleeding immediately. And you kind of thought, wow, you know, whatever's happened here, he's been absolutely smacked across the head. And... You know, when you saw it was Rory Hargraves, you just kind of thought, oh, man, you know, not again. Um, but his arm was down. I mean, he could have grabbed hold of his own shorts as he was going into the tackle. That's how low down his arm was. Um, people say that he started to swing it in, but that wasn't the case. He's just bracing himself for the impact. His arm was straight down. And, yeah, just a. it was one of those ones that we've talked about a little bit before where it was an absolute accident. Um, the player fell into his arm, and I don't know what you would get out of suspending a player in that circumstance because you're not teaching him a lesson. So what would a suspension really serve in in the instance where there's an accident where a player's arm was down by his side? Like yeah, it's just a freak thing. I think you too, if you took if you took the other Roosters defender out of it, and there was no head clash. Mm. I guess they would have just been play on and no one would have said anything about it. That's yeah, how I, I that's agree. how mad it is. Yeah, yeah. It was just it was really unlucky. And look uh, South play was very sick after that one. Um I'd be shocked if he played next week. Yeah, but likewise. yeah, there was a there was a few knocks, hey, especially towards the end of the game. It was, it was brutal. interesting. South ended up with um twelve players on the field. We might talk about that a little bit later, but they ended up with 12 players on the field because they didn't have somebody else to run on the field when uh, Reynolds was taken off. They were, wanted to assess him, and Reynolds had been hitting the throat, and you could actually see him saying as he was going off that I was hitting the throat. And then the, the trainer said something to him, and he was like, oh, fuck me. You know, you could yeah. read it. It was pretty funny. But, yeah, they left them with 12 players, and um, but they handled it pretty well. So it was a really, really good win for Souths. 
A lot um, of big hits too. Even even after Reynolds came off that first tackle afterwards, yeah. Um, one of the Roosters players just read a play from the, uh, sorry, one of the Rabbitohs players read a play from the Roosters so well. Um, Cam Murray abs- wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Polax, the Roosters player, got the ball on the inside, just read it perfectly, and just crunched him. He really did. And the thing was, Damn. you could see him because he was watching Tedesco, and. He he could see Tedesco was going to pass, and he it was incredible, but incredible to see his footwork in in play while he was in defence because he was tracking across for Tedesco, and then as he saw he was getting ready to pass, his footwork allowed him to be in a perfect position. And I can't remember who the ball runner was coming through was, but he just annihilated him. It was he so good. Yeah. yeah, um, that is just that was perfect technique. Um, reading of defence, everything. Everything about that was just absolutely spot on. Yeah, and it Couldn't... just I mean, that was the last play of the game, basically. Yeah. It was all over at that point. So, um, yeah, really good win for the Roosters. Uh, sorry, for the South Sydney and the Roosters. I feel as though a lot of these teams, these top teams, they don't mind too much having a loss towards the end of the season because it means that you don't get to grand final day and it's like, well, they've got to win seven in a row to win the grand final. Yeah, also, there's always that burden, too, if you've gone on a big winning run, that yep. people start talking, oh, the next loss is just around the corner. Exactly. The corner. And yep. But the Roosters have won seven straight before tonight, so they've got that bogey off their back. They've had that loss. Yeah. They're going completely fine. Um, South, so oh God, I don't know how much damage I take from that game. Yeah, well, I mean, it was interesting because when Reynolds went down and he'd been, he, it was an accidental elbow to the throat from Boyd Cordner and Reynolds went down and I was actually going to tweet about 20 minutes before that it's kind of weird to see Reynolds running around fit and healthy in the last round of the season because normally he's just busted at this point of the year and it really puts the brakes on their finals campaign. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it they they did get knocked around. I think the Roosters got knocked around a little bit, probably not as much. But I tell you what, it was a brutal game for the last round of the season for no real reward for either team. So yeah, there's no reason for it. It's just fantastic footy. It really was. I really enjoyed. That was one of the most enjoyable games for me all season. Absolutely, yeah. Full credit to both sides. That was brilliant. Yeah, it really was. And twenty thousand there too at the ground. Um, it's not a good stadium, ANZ Stadium, but. To get 20,000 to that match was fantastic. So, South fans should really be applauded for that. Absolutely. Not the other ones. No. Uh, <laughs> they weren't there. Um, so. Yes. <laughs> so, I was just okay. re- looking, I was just looking okay. for a bit of information to you about Isaac okay. Luke because there's talk okay. that he could be getting poached by Manly. And I had a feeling when we wrote this down. That Isaac Luke had, had discussed the fact that he's probably looking at retiring at the end of the year. Now there's talk that he could be going to Manly for next season. Yeah, and look... I, and that's given Manly's just got rid of um, Coruscant, who's gone back to, to Penrith. So they need a hooker. They do. I don't know that Isaac Luke's the guy for them, though. I Like, I think that he's he's just shown his age a little bit. And, that, and no wonder, I mean, at his best, he was absolutely brilliant and a dynamic ball runner out of dummy half brutal in, in with his defense and i just think it's showing these days um i don't think he's been at his best at the warriors so i, I if i was manly i wouldn't be looking at him personally um i don't know any other alternatives i mean maybe they could look at getting the young bloke from penrith that's all of a sudden the all of the media is saying oh he's a young superstar that's been you know shelved for coruscant but um, yeah, I wouldn't be going after Luke at all. I'll tell you what, what do you I'm, reckon? I wouldn't mind him at the West Tigers. Oh, really? You look at who we've got for hooker next year, for the start of the year. No one. Probably yeah. Elijah Taylor. <laughs> Jesus oh, man. Christ. So, oh, man. I, I, just... I wouldn't mind Isaac Luke. Mostly because his game isn't too different to Robbie Farrer's. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be handy for the club. Even if they sign him oh. for one year, two years, well, who cares? Something like that. Yeah. He wouldn't be that expensive anymore either. Well, here's the thing. Say he is available 
and I wondered this with all of the hookers. Why aren't the West Tigers looking at any of them? I don't know. Like they they genuinely need one for next year because I I I can't I can't accept that they're thinking genuinely of having Josh Reynolds at hooker next year. No, they it just can't because, work. Well, the thing I got with it is even if he does make it work. Mm. Benji Marshall's probably going to retire at the end of next year. Who's then going to replace him in the halves? Yeah. And I'd argue that it's probably cheaper to get a hooker than it is to get a five-eighth or a half. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, it would be, yeah. Yeah. I, look, I wonder if they've got some youngster in the lower grades that they're, like, keeping under wraps. That's the only thing it could be because I just can't imagine that they're leaving that area. And I, I've got full faith in Maguire that he'll address it. But it just seems as though they could have... Saw, I mean, Coruscant would have been brilliant for them. Well, this is the thing why I thought Luke would go well there, because he, he and um, Maguire worked very well together. Yeah. And I just thought Maguire could get the best out of him for another season and a half. That's all he needs. Because mm-hmm. you've got to think, too, we need a we need a hooker for the start of the year until until Little's healthy again. Yeah, but then you're gonna you're gonna need a genuine hooker to be available if Little gets injured again, and because mm-hmm. that's what's un, it's unfortunate. It's not a criticism of Blake. You can't criticize him for getting injured. Some people are just injury prone, and it's not like he's yeah. getting the same injury every time. They're always different ones. Yeah, um, and they've been a bit freakish too. So, but the fact of the matter is he is injury prone. They do need a decent backup. And even if he's not injury prone, they still don't have a backup anyway. What do you think about all of and, this talk about Chris Lawrence? Yeah, look, there's, there's talk that he's on the outer and he's unhappy at the Tigers because they won't give him a contract. Yeah. Um, I'll put it like this, okay? And I mean, again, I mean, this is no slur against Chris Lawrence. Been a great club and everything, but... If he's going on the open market, who's going to buy him? And, and this is what I was thinking during the week as well when I was reading about all of this, um, I don't know, blowing up. And it hasn't been too much blown up by the West Tigers fans that I've seen. But I tend to miss a lot of the West Tigers Twitter buzz for some reason. I don't know why. Um, yeah. I'm not I, like, much I of thought it if, if Lawrence doesn't end up at the Tigers, where does he end up? And I couldn't think of anybody that would go after him, to be honest. That's the thing. And it's not because he's... It's not because he's bad or anything like that, but it's because there's little upside to him. Like, yeah. sure, he's he's a great role model to have around a club. That's mm-hmm. that's unquestionable. Yeah. Um, you know, he's not going to get any trouble. He's going to be a good role model for a lot of the young players. Um, on the field, he does run... He runs absolutely gorgeous lines on the field. Mm-hmm. Very few ball runners out there are on the same line as him, you know, same level as him when it comes to ball running and hitting lines and gaps. Yeah. But he has been known to be clumsy with his hands, mm-hmm. especially as he's got older. Um, he's not getting faster. The the savage injuries he's had. You talk. You want to talk about freakish injuries and sort of savage ones. He's had the worst that I've, I can think of of any player. Um, yeah, I can't think of anyone worse that's had just though like, and and I've said it before. If, if one club had those catastrophic injuries over the time he's played, you'd be like, "Wow, that's unbelievable!" But he's had it himself. Yeah, and at the end of the day, my main motivation for not signing Chris Lawrence at the West Tigers is because I want the bastard to be able to live comfortably in his retirement. Yeah, but he I wonder... deserves that much. He's given so much to that club. And he's been there for quite a while. I fear he's one more injury away from, you know, severely impacting the rest of his life. Not in a way that he's going to get killed, but in a way that he could probably just be living the rest of his life in agony. In pain, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's had that massive facial trauma that went on. that to rebuild his face. Um, a dislocated hip, for Christ's sake. I mean, those are not easy things to recover from. And those are not things that you, you get injured and it just goes back to 100% for eternity. No. Once you damage that, it stays damaged to some degree, and it doesn't get better. No, you end and, up having to get a hip replacement eventually. 
Yeah, and like it's going to lead to things like, you know, it's probably going to lead to osteoporosis or arthritis or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be good. And I don't want to see players demanding to keep playing or, you know, forced to keep playing all sorts of stuff when you know that it could be impacting their their living standards, I guess, when they retire. Because as we know, with any athlete in any sport, it's not, you know, after they retire, unless they were absolute test stars or freaks and they get a gig in the media, they largely get forgotten pretty quickly. Yeah, and the other thing is too, like he's had a good long career. It's not like he hasn't had a long career and that he hasn't done a lot of different things or that there's, you know, some sort of unfinished business. Yeah, I mean, he, he debuted in 2006, the age mm-hmm. of 17. Mm-hmm. So he's still young. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's only just 30. Yeah, I wonder how he'd go in the media, hey? He'd be brain in the media. Um, I don't think I've heard him talk too much. No, he's pretty good with his with his speaking. He's got um, he's got a charity lined up. He's doing um, doing talks and stuff like that as well. Okay, he's, he's setting himself up nicely for you know life after football and doing stuff that's going to help society out and mass, which is great stuff as well. Mm-hmm. So, if I, I wonder if pro- you know how he had the terrible facial injuries. I wonder if eventually one day, when it gets cold, his face will hurt. As possible, yeah. Like, I wonder if it's like that. Like, I, I broke my leg when I was um, six, and it, not so much now, but it used to, when it was cold, I, I, it would ache. It would really ache. Um, I wonder if if it'll be the same sort of thing, you know, with uh, with his face. It'd be very you'd strange to, You'd have to think that would be the case. Yeah. You can't expect to go through that amount of bone trauma and not have some sort of long-term side effects. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow. So, yeah, look, the other thing too is the Tigers need to free up space. Mm-hmm. And while Lawrence isn't on huge money, um, not not signing him next year does free up a bit of space. Yeah, so, and they need a semi-reset too, you know. The, I mean, mm. they're going to be coming out the back of the Robbie Farrer era in terms of their, their uh, hook position. Um, I think they'll move Reynolds on in the off-season personally. I don't know where to, but I feel like they'll facilitate that move. If they can get rid of, um, what's his name, Packer, that would free up a little bit of space, although I don't know how they're going to be able to make that happen. Um, Madalena could be getting a medical retirement. He's done his knee a few times this year, and they might be able to get out of that one a bit there, which would free up a huge chunk of money if they can. I saw um, Hodgson's, Hod, Hod, Hodkinson got a medical retirement at Manly, by the way. Yes, yes. Um, that might yeah, have happened months ago. I just saw it then. It no, it, it, so it, came up in, it came up in the news today uh, okay. or yesterday. Um, yeah, yeah he's, he's been retired. Another one of those guys who would be, you know, a good influence around a club, mm-hmm. and he'd, he'd make a pretty good kicking coach at a club too. Yeah, that's the one yeah. good thing out about his game. He's a good kicking, good kicking game. I feel as though he just, I, th- I feel like at the right club, he would have, he would have played for like ten years straight through. Yeah. But I you feel know where, as though he just he never ended up good. in the right situation. Where he would have been good was alongside Ash Taylor. Yeah, he would have, yeah. Just that steady hand that got him around the park. Yeah. Take the kicking game duties off him. Even take the goal kicking off him. Just say, look, mate, just think about ball playing and running the ball. That's all you got to do. Mm-hmm. That's what they needed. I don't know why they didn't go with that. I mean, it's kind of why they brought over um, Tyrone Roberts to, to, to do some of that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, anyways, um, someone else who left the game... Thinking of coming back is Semi Radraja. Yeah, pretty exciting. Looking to yeah. come back for 2021. Yeah, and there already has been Parramatta has already said we're not interested anymore. Yeah, which um, is understandable. I mean, they've got Ferguson, who's going to be on a nice amount of money, and he's a, a very good winger. And the way Sevo's playing, I mean, they, uh, he's on you know, well, very little money, and he's doing basically what Radraja was yeah, doing. Yeah. And Sivo's he wants just a replaced, million bucks, just about. Yeah, Sivo's just replaced Radraja. Mm. That's all that's happened there. Um, so the Bulldogs are licked to him at the moment. 
Yeah. I I don't, I don't know about that, hey. I don't think he's the sort of player the Bulldogs need. I think the Bulldogs would be better off spending time developing Jaden Oakenball because I think that kid's going to be huge and he'd, he'd yeah. do whatever Seminar Draja could do anyway, uh, you know, with some good development. Yeah. I think that's where they need to focus there. Um, I can't justify spending a million dollars on any winger. Unless they I... can guarantee you that they can score you five tries every game, fair enough. Yeah. Or if it's Thomas Mackinson. <laughs> well, you know, he's the best player in the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> I could only do it if it was, if he was the finishing piece for for your team. So say, uh, and I, I've, I've said this earlier in the year, I, I think the thought of, and I don't know what sort of physical condition Sammy's in, but if you had Sammy Radradra come at running the ball back and then on the back of him you had Jason Tamalolo at the Cowboys, I just think that that's a horror show for any opposition team. But the Cowboys have a lot of other issues that they need to fix before the wing. Like, um, say, for instance, the, for whatever reason, a team like, uh, who would be one? I mean, I'm trying to think who would be a good team for him to go to. That, like, say, f- for whatever reason, the say Cameron Smith gets to the end of the year, he wins a title and says, "Yeah, I'm, I'm up, I'm leaving," and he leaves a fair chunk of change there for one season that basically the the uh, storm <clears throat> storm have for no one. And Sammy says, "Yeah, I'll take that money just for one year." I'd be like, yeah, that's a good move. You know, they've got everything covered. They've got the hooker covered. They where would he play, though? I would play him. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, they've got the wingers sorted, haven't they? Yeah. This is the thing. I think if for the amount of money that he wants, yeah, he needs to become a fullback. And, oh, yeah, and I don't think that that would I work. Don't, eh? I don't think he's got the positional... No how for that. You know the other problem he's got? Like, there are dudes that are just walking down the street right now in Fiji yeah. that are the same size and yeah. can run like lightning, and yeah. you just chuck them a football, and they are just... Uh, it's like, what the hell, man? All, all the wingers should be Fijian. I've yeah, said this got, many, many got times. Munavalu, Ravalawa, Sivo... Um, there was one up at the Nene McDonald. I think he's Papua New Guinean. But um, yeah, those, those Islander wingers are absolute. Just they're insane athletes. Well, you look at Ravalawa, right? And I, I called him on the weekend, um, in reserve grade. Now he's in reserve grade, and he's he's still learning the game, and his hands aren't fantastic. But I saw him chasing the ball. And just in the process of going after a ball, absolutely annihilate <laughs> a play from the other team because he is big, he is strong, he's a whole lot of human, and he can run like the wind. And it's like, it's unbelievable, you know? Yeah. And I think the thing about Sammy, I mean, Sivo is doing pretty much what Sammy was doing when he was at the, at the Eels. Yeah. Like, he's just sort of taken over that. I think Sivo's uh, improved out of sight this year too. Like his first few games, they were they were tough to watch. A little sketchy, but, yeah. But once he got his confidence up and started to find his place and get comf- comfortable with it, um, yeah, he came along in leaps and bounds. They don't, yeah. they don't need Red Roger there. They've already got no, him. Not at all. The only, the, way I could, the only way I could justify it for Parramatta is if for whatever reason Ferguson chose to go somewhere else or... You yeah. know, whatever. I, I don't know if he cho- if he decided he wanted to go back to Canberra weirdly or something like that, um, or the Sharks, or you know, maybe the he was offered the fullback role up at North Queensland, some weird thing like that, and they freed up the space and they got, you know, Sammy. Uh, can you imagine Sammy and Sevo? Oh man, they would have a back three of two of the best ball runners. In well, the, the thing, though, I guess, is in 2021, Blake Ferguson's going to be 31 turning 32. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And Semi would be what twenty is about twenty seven by then, something like that. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh no, he's twenty seven now, so he'll be twenty nine in twenty twenty one. Oh man, that changes the discussion. That does. That changes it. Yeah, I can only sign him on a. I could. I couldn't pay him more than four hundred. As a twenty nine year old winger that hasn't played rugby league for by then, what four years, something yeah. like that. I'm, yeah, I'm. I'm with you on that one. He's not near. He's not near nine hundred thousand. Yeah. See, Close I it. thought he was a little bit younger. Twenty seven. Yeah. And I know it's not that much different. Twenty seven years old. I'm like, yeah, we're going to get his best years. At 29, I'm worried that he's going to, his legs are just going to go on him, which happens to wingers. But one day they just, it's like, oh, he can't run anymore. Now, someone who's younger and could possibly earn that sort of money is Valentine Holmes. Mm -hmm. And I think this week he was announced as being part of the, he was a train on squad. Which yep, means he's so not going to be. He was. He's not going to be in the NFL squad this year. Is yeah, that my under, that, my understanding is is that if you become part of the train on squad, you basically cannot play in the NFL this year. Mm. Which is kind of weird, but yeah, that's how it goes apparently. So there's talk that the Cowboys have nine hundred grand in the bank. Yeah, and they were the ones who were initially looking at taking Holmes on when he was debating whether to go to NFL or not because they had the money then after Thurston retired, and it was uh, Ben Barber too. Yeah, that's who they spent the money on, and yep. then immediately got it back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to see Holmes back in the NRL, and I would actually like to see him at the Cowboys. Yeah, same here. Man, I, I he just changed that club around us in a, in a heartbeat. The thing about him is, I think he, the only way that I think he comes back because he he said the whole time I don't mind just being on the on the training squad for the Jets or another team. So he he has got to where he wants to be, and I think he showed enough in those NFL preseason games. I mean, I know he didn't get a a, a gig, a starting gig, but he didn't do anything wrong which is massive, and they want to keep him around. So they see something in him, obviously. Um, but the thing for me is that if one day he kind of, because these managers will be saying to, to him, listen, you're on a basically minimum wage here, and there's nearly a million bucks waiting for you back at home to live in, in North Queensland. And he's going to be like, yep, yep, yep. And I just wonder if one day he wakes up and in the cold New York you know, he pulls out the pads and stuff, and he just says, man, what am I doing? And, and not that I am criticizing what he's doing, because I think it's great. Not that I'm saying he's doing the wrong thing, because you do what you want in life. As long as you're not hurting anyone, just, you know, if he's enjoying himself, good luck to him. I love it. But sometimes you just, sometimes your pathway changes. And for a million bucks, you know, he might, He's going to have people in his ear the whole time saying a million dollars to Valentine, you know, and one day he might just wake up and be like, yeah, I think maybe I need that cash. That's the thing. I think at the moment, I'm just doing a quick look on Google, mm -hmm. that he'd be on around 260 to 300 grand a year just as a train on squad member. See, I, it, That's like, US I, dollars. Yeah. It's, <laughs> we love US dollars, you and me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I, I look. I don't know. I know it's it's not close to the NFL starting money, which a lot of people tend to talk up in some cases more than it actually is. But um, yeah, look, if it's that much, he's he's getting a whack. But well, it's yeah, just the team, team, team nine team nine players in the practice squad are earning a minimum salary of five grand a week. That was in I think that was based in twenty twelve. Okay. But the, I, minimum I, rookie, I, the minimum rookie salary was 390 grand. For the NFL? Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't think he'll be getting that, though. I, and no. I, could be, I could be completely wrong, right? But I feel like he won't be getting that. I feel like he would be on... I mean, he might be earning, like, less than 100 grand this year. I would not be shocked by that. Because... And the other thing is, too, if they... 
if they are paying these practice squad players per week, you can turn up one week and they say, oh, yeah, thanks. We don't need you anymore. Like, it can be over that quickly for a practice squad player. Um, It can be over like that for, you know, an NFL player in the full squad. So um, that that situation could change very quickly. I don't know if I was in there. If I was any NRL club, I don't know that I'd like to have 900,000 just sitting around doing nothing in my salary cap. What about you? Yeah, you'd need to find somewhere to to park that. I think yeah. the Cowboys need to get some centers. Yeah, they, some they, strike out wide. I mean, they had Cohen Hess playing what five games out there this year. That's just that's a horrible situation to be in. Um, Asiata at five eighth for half the year. I, I think we start to see where they need some depth. They need some. They need some centers. They need a backup five eighth. They need a backup fullback as well. You've yeah, got nearly could, million dollars, million bucks sitting around. Get two strike centers and grab two two young playmakers, a fullback and a five eight. What if? Okay, I just had a thought. Then David Fafita at the Broncos. Now there's talk that he will get seven hundred grand from the Broncos, but there are other clubs willing to offer him more. Would you offer him nine hundred thousand as the Cowboys? No. Okay. I don't I know that would, the Cowboys' second row needs that much bulking up. I, I think their backs are the big issue there. See, I think I would probably do it. Cause, because Fafita's a teenager and he's doing things that are ridiculous, right? And True. I just think I would love to, I would just love to partner Tamalolo with a. Can you imagine him and Fafita? It would be a nightmare for opposition sides. Like, Absolutely. you know, but. If I was know. the West Tigers, I'd say to him, how much do you want? And if we Please can't give it to you, if we can't take it, give it to you in cash, yeah. how many apartments would you like from Meriton? <laughs> and by the way, when you retire, right, we've worked the deal out. When you retire, you become an ambassador. And they, yeah, it's all above board. Don't worry about it. We'll, yeah. we'll talk yeah. to the NRL about it. Yeah, we'll tell the NRL via the media. It'll be all fine. Yeah. We've been, we've we'll, done this before because you know we've got just a potato here right now. now. Yeah, we've got just a potato here. He's have, he'll have a chat about it. He'll make it work. <laughs> As I love thinking about things like that, like with someone like Fafita, <clears throat> Fafita, and what he's shown already in his career, and do like are you with somebody that's putting in those performances and the thing that he's probably missing is the extra work rate but is he worth is he worth a big whack of money like that right now and you know you might be playing paying a premium to get him to your club but is that worth it and i I love questions like that because i think i was gonna say i think that's the kind of player that you have a properly structured back into contract for because I worry when it comes to young players like kids that young yeah. when you give them that much money mm-hmm. you're going to get one of two results one they either continue playing to their potential or they go I'm fucking rich yeah and that's a worry that's a big concern um so that's why a back-ended contract works for younger players. And you go, you know, we'll give you four hundred grand this year. And next year it'll be five hundred, then it'll be six hundred, then it'll be seven hundred. So you stay with us and you keep progressing. You'll get paid more as your contract goes on. You don't offer those deals though to established players in their mid to late twenties, which is what a lot of clubs had been doing to try and sneak their way through the salary cap. Yeah, you try and get a star player in peak form. You pay them unders for the first two years, and then you massively overpay them for the last two when they don't deserve it. That's what clubs are doing, yeah. and that's the problem. So back of the well, contracts, when work properly, have definitely a good value, but no one used them properly. No, I don't think so too. And I mean, the the other contract you have is the DCE Tomalolo contract, where I mean, Tomalolo is on a ten year. $10 million contract. And when it was given to him, it was like, what the hell, man? This is crazy. It, it feels like it's a bargain now. 
It does. Like a, a I, million I, bucks? I, if, I so, if somebody if... come to me and said a million bucks for Tal Malolo and he wants to sign for eight years, I'm like, get him the contract as soon as possible and get his signature on it. I need his signature on it right now. Exactly. I, I wonder if in about three years' time, he looks back on that and go, hmm, probably should have went a bit more highballing on it. <laughs> well, I feel as though on a contract like that, there would have to be some sort of um, protections for him going forward. And there probably is for the club as well. Like if he if he is unable to play, say, 50% of his games, or he only plays 25% of his games in year six and seven, that might void the rest of the contract, something like that. And I feel as though he would have something in his favour. Because when you're signing a 10-year deal, both sides of, of that negotiation, and look, that's what the money's for, as I like to say, but yeah. both sides of that negotiation are saying, look, you're happy here, we're happy to have you here, we want to pay you like we do think you deserve to be paid. You're the man at our club. And let's do a deal that makes us both happy. So I feel as though if he went to them in two or three years because the cap went up and said, look, I want 1.2. I feel as though they'd say, yes, Mr. Talmalolo, here's your 1.2. And it exactly. will give you a 1.3 if we can sort it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a very good deal that he's got over there. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of clubs would be wishing they had a million, a million dollar Talmalolo on their side. Oh. Oh, can you imagine? Oh, I'm having a crisis just thinking about it. <laughs> Tamalolo on a 10 year. You got Tamalolo for 10 years. Oh, on, on a million. And oh. when I think of the things like Russell Packer and Ben Madalino <laughs> on 700 grand each, I'm pretty sure we're playing fucking Talmo 800 grand or something like that. It's horrible to think about, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. But, you know, I, at least as a Panthers fan, I get to know that if we sign someone to a, a like a four-year contract that's ridiculous, they're only they're going to be gone in 16 months. Like, they're not going to be around. <laughs> I wonder if the players now balk every time they get a contract extension for four years at the Panthers. Oh, yeah. I know what you're trying to tell me here. They walk, they walk out of the office. And they said, what happened, man? You look sad. And it's like, yeah, they just gave me four years, 950 grand. It's like, oh, man. Uh, Are you ooh. renting? I hope you're renting. <laughs> you better start putting some of that into your super, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you buy yourself a house. Yeah. Um, now, let's get on to the big biscuits. Okay. let's. These are the main... This is the main things that we're going to talk about in this episode. <laughs> yeah, that, that was entree done. Yeah. John Rebo, the architect. The architect. The orchestrator. Mm. What other things do, do they call him? The uh, mastermind. The mastermind. That's a good one. That's been, It hasn't been used for a while, but he was the mastermind for a while. The mastermind. I do like architect, though. He drew it all up, even though he I, didn't. But I he like drew it all up. It. It like it, it almost it, it's like he sat down and he had one of those weird desks and he had a protractor and a compass and he started putting like lines and stuff and he was like, Oh yeah, this goes here, that goes there. So the reason I'll talk about him is um cricket cricket's uh, journalist Robert Craddock, who thinks he's a rugby league journalist, um, wrote an article uh, just said, expansion pioneer John Rebo says Sydney clubs need to follow the Storm's lead. Yeah, because like I remember when uh, in Huddersfield, John Rebo was in the back of the room going, Yeah, this game will take over elsewhere. Maybe it should take it to other places. Yeah, where did he take it to? Well, Swinton. <laughs> Swinton. <laughs> I don't know who Swinton is. All I know of is Manchester, Andrew. The- the Manchester Lions. Yes. Because Swinton flushed 150 years of their legacy down the drain. Ah, oh, that wonderful Cause, legacy. Because they changed their name. Mm. They still have Swinton on the badge, but they changed their name, so that's all gone. I, I, I really do. I feel as though in the next couple of years, 
Swinton was going to be like top of Super League. <laughs> with the 35 fans coming in to celebrate with them. I'm telling you, they threw them 35 fans away. I know that they're targeting a whole metropolitan area now. Yeah, but they're, those... they're only looking at a million people now, but they've lost those 35 fans for good. Yep. That's, that's unforgivable. Everyone. Exactly. It, it's funny how the first non-Super League club to actually use its brain and do the right thing is being... <laughs> being pilloried by its fans. <laughs> I know, I. Ah, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyways, had to get that out of the way. Yeah, um, we, that's but we've both had that within us for a good forty-eight <laughs> hours. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking about how to get that one out. Um, yeah. What's John Revo after? Well, basically, because there's all of this media, completely media created, to, like. The NRL has said nothing really about, they've said nothing about, the only things that they've come out and said is, we are not going to relocate a Sydney club and we're not looking to expand anytime soon, basically. Um, And so all of this is just media driven. I guess we're part of the media to a certain extent now, but we're more commentating on what these idiots are talking about. So the next cab off the rank is to get straight, you ring up John Rebo. He's working at the Queensland Rugby League doing something. And uh, he say, hey, Reeves, do you want to talk to me about expansion? And, of course, John Reeves says, I'd love to be in the media. So uh, they asked him a little bit about expansion, and he said, yeah, they should move Sydney Club and they should chuck it up in Brisbane. And But they were calling him like the, the pioneer of expansion clubs and stuff. And it was just ridiculous what the, how they were describing him. <laughs> now... I'm looking at an article from March in the yep. Sydney Morning Herald about how he was saying that expansion in the NRL has to happen, but it must come at the expense of Sydney clubs. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a disturbing quote that he comes up with here. Okay, hit me with it. I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm saying relocate the baby. <laughs> All right. So... Taking babies out of their homes and putting them somewhere else where they've never been before apparently is a good thing to do. Yeah, that's a weird quote, hey? Sometimes people take a good quote <laughs> that's been around for like a thousand years and they just slaughter it. Like when yeah. Larry Daly said that some team was into this game up to their earballs. <laughs> like, it's like, come on, stop stop freestyling with these quotes. You're the, you're the footy players. You aren't smart enough for this. Yeah, just say what's on your mind. Don't yeah. try and get cute with, with English. You're not good at it. Exactly. Wow, that's relocate the baby. Relocate the baby. <sighs> Wowee. Does he know where babies come from? Uh, Should we, You know what? I bet we can find his email address. <laughs> he works for say, the URL. We'll say, email him. I, was say, I bet he thinks the babies come from Rupert Murdoch. Probably. Ooh, biting. Oh. Um... <laughs> It will sound like Sydney bashing, but I think over time, teams will be going from Sydney and going to other areas. I'd love to see them do that. There will be some pain with it, but if it's done the right way, it can be very successful. When you see some clubs in financial difficulty, we should be protecting ourselves to start with. That should be the main priority. That's the thing, though, with the TV rights dealers. The clubs now get their player salaries completely paid for, Mm -hmm. and... The clubs themselves also get a, a grant from the from the NRL as well. Yeah, and look, I, there's been a little bit of talk from not so much people within the game, people outside the game about the financial health of the clubs. Now, maybe you can help me with this, Andrew. Do you remember when we came out of the Super League war and the clubs weren't getting much money from the NRL and how they were saying, oh, we don't run in the black. We're all running at a loss, right? Mm. And then do you remember what happened when they basically doubled that a few years later? Not under the ARLC, but still, you know, under News Limited slash the ARL. Do you remember what they were saying when that grant was doubled? What they, how, how well they were off financially? And lightness. <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah, we're not in the black. We're running at a loss. <laughs> and then the ARL commission comes in. And we go up to having a $2 billion TV deal. And they all have the biggest expense they've got covered dollar for dollar in terms of 
ten million dollar grants, covers all of their first grade squad. They've just got to sort out sponsorships and you know all that sort of thing. And you know what they say? Yeah, we're we're not running in the black. We're running at a loss. <laughs> so I just don't pay attention to it because I mean the first thing is if you've got the perfect rugby league club and they're getting fifty million dollars a year for whatever reason. You should not have one dollar left at the end of the year because any extra dollar you have could have been put into player development, could have been put into facilities, whatever. So a perfect club just runs completely even at the end of the year. But these clubs have always claimed that they're losing money for forever and they're all still around and they're getting 10 million bucks a year. They're not, don't, don't worry about the financial health of clubs, I don't think. No. Um, that's the thing though. The the rich always put their hand out for more money, mm-hmm. and that's what we've got here. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't doubt that the difference between what the Brisbane Broncos can spend on certain things is vastly different compared to what the Cronulla Sharks can spend, right? But at the same time, the Sharks are fine. They're all yeah, right. yeah. Absolutely they are. I mean, they own their own ground and they're upgrading it. Exactly. The Sharks. They're fine. Like the broke-ass team of the league. Well, They're this, fine. I think this is a thing too. I'm starting to think that that Sharks being broke team thing has become a myth. I think that yeah. development deal they've got has given them a ton of money. The fact mm-hmm. they're able to upgrade their own venue, which they own, shows that they've got enough money in the bank. I don't know that they're the poorest team anymore. I think it's I think it's manly. But oh yeah, manly, definitely. Definitely. Which is I, I don't funny, even and I don't even think Cronulla are a team that's close to being financially insolvent. Well, this is the this is the wealthiest they've ever been. Oh, one hundred percent. By a long, long way. Yeah. Um I they're, I I, I was just say think... I'm pretty sure they're debt free. Yep. And yeah, they got money in the bank. I I don't see how or why the media, especially, keeps going on about how they're still one of the financial cripple clubs. I I don't I don't understand how that is. I've never seen a balance sheet to suggest that. And oddly enough, the mainstream media never produces one either. No. See, I I agree with you that Manly are probably in the worst position, and that's not a slight against their owner. I just think that. The they're just not run very well, and obviously playing out of the at Brookvale Oval. I mean, there's a lot of money that's been left on the table just from the facilities they're playing out of. Um, I've I've talked to uh, people within the game that have told me about some of the finances in terms of how much money you can get from a stadium that has the corporate facilities and how much you can get from stadium that doesn't have adequate corporate facilities. And you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a game difference Mm. per game, you know? So I can't imagine how much less Manly is getting corporate out of its corporate sector compared to somewhere like Parramatta where they've got the beautiful brand new stadium and gorgeous corporate boxes and things like that. So, um, yeah, the Sharks, I think that they're trying to shore themselves up as best they can. I think at one point it's just going to come down to crowd numbers, to be honest with you. I think that there will be a point where all of these teams are at at such a, a strong position that people just generally start to look at and say, hey, we're spending $10 million plus because we're talking about the future on a team that's only getting 12,000 people through the gate and what the return on that really isn't great. No, that's all right. It's not um, going to be so much, oh, they're broke. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what else did he say in this old article? Um, the other thing is 18 is a very strange number of teams to play with in terms of getting the right mix of games for everybody. The AFL experienced that a little bit. They have increased numbers and clearly some teams haven't been competitive. It's hard to sustain and line up your blockbusters. Now, I'd say this from the outset. That's a bad example because, as we were discussing off air, the AFL is struggling with their teams mm. above above the Victorian border. Mm-hmm. 
you know, the Sydney team are uh, a former Victorian team. Mm-hmm. The, the the Brisbane Lions had to be merged with the Victorian team so people could, yeah. you know, align themselves with them. The Suns are a financial black hole they have poured countless millions of dollars into, and mm-hmm. it's still dead last on the ladder, miles behind everyone else. Mm-hmm. And the Giants, I believe, are also a financial strain, not a severe one like the Suns are, mm-hmm. but one and a strain nonetheless. Yeah. So comparing yourself to that is is bad. Plus, it's a completely different game. I hate I hate it when people compare AFL with rugby league because everything about the two games is diametrically opposed. Yeah, yeah. I in fact I I've, I've thought for many many years the real fight is AFL and soccer. You know because they're aiming for the same sort of uh, I don't know if you'd call it athlete, but the same sort of people. Um, that aren't looking to play. At the, I mean, rugby league is a weird sport, man. You pick up the ball and you've got 13 other people that are trying to physically drag you to the ground and you've got to run at them. You know, yeah. it's a weird sport. Not everyone's, not everyone is wired like that. And I think that AFL is kind of aiming for the people that aren't wired like that. Um, and yeah, they. I mean, their league is terribly uneven for a number of different reasons. Whereas you look at the NRL, I mean, and we've talked about this just earlier today, the Titans are the worst team in the competition. It's not because they're not talented. And if the Titans turned it around next year and like finished, say, in 10th place, I was going to say ninth, but we know who will finish there. That's but right. If they finished in 10th place, you'd be like, oh, it's not shocking at all. No. Um, if the Warriors finished in the top three next year under a new coach, you wouldn't be shocked. No, it, you know it's it's so the NRL is way way closer. Has it's a very very different dynamic. So yeah, I agree with you on on that. Um, yeah. Plus, that even like without even being facetious, I mean, you look at the AFL player; it's a completely different athlete. They are yeah. cardio heavy. They can run for so many more kilometers in a game than a rugby league player can. Mm-hmm. But there's no way in hell an AFL player can sustain the physical blows that a rugby league player sustains mm-hmm. in half an hour, 40, let alone 80 minutes. Mm. They're just two completely different athletes. Yeah, definitely. And I don't, and they're two different games, two different sports. They've got two different mindsets. I don't know why people have got this whole AFL versus league thing. It's just, it confuses me. You know, one game as well is, is not so great on TV. You have to go and watch it at the ground. So they get massive mm-hmm. crowds, but the TV ratings aren't as good as the NRL. NRL mm-hmm. is played. Majority of the game is played between 10 metres. You can get one camera to focus on that the whole time and get all the action you need. I you actually saw... It's you interesting. Can't do it in you, AFL. No, it's interesting you brought this up. I actually saw there's a test you can look at on YouTube. If you put in, I believe I searched for NRL and 4K. Um, and you can, I think what it was is it was a test that was run by Fox Sports where they basically had one 4K camera and they were seeing if you, instead of having a physical zoom, if they could digitally zoom in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I believe that's what it was now. And there's a couple of videos like that. I didn't look at the second one, but the first one, and it didn't look like the zoom worked particularly well from the the time that I watched it, but it was interesting to me because if you could do that, you might end up in a situation where you only like these broadcasts will become way cheaper basically um, because you've only got the one fixed camera and you, if they can get that to be an 8K camera, I mean they'll just be able to have that and be able to have the director you know being in control of the zoom I guess yeah but there's um, no way you're going to be getting one camera doing a game of AFL because ne- that never. ball goes in all different directions at any time and it's constantly moving at top speed yeah whereas definitely. rugby league it's just you know it's generally four or five movements they're all it's not slow but it's just the fact that it doesn't move erratically backwards and forwards and left and right and everything yeah so I it's remember, more consistent with its movement I think it was the head of Fox um US Fox Sports US and he was an Australian bloke and I can't remember his name but I remember once he was talking about the rugby league it was when the rugby league rights were up one of the times and he said look rugby league is the the very he said it's the most perfect TV sport in the whole world 
because you you can focus on all of the it's this field sport that you can focus on all of the action in a very small space and you can then hit a wide shot and get sweeping movements that are all very you know pleasing to the eye yeah so yeah and and we're lucky that our sport is like that really yeah it's just built for it yeah um so let's Mm -hmm. go to our next person our final matter of the day Philip yeah. Ronald Gould. Ah, Gus is at it again. He's the old man's got an idea. Mm. This is one that no one's ever had before, too. Yeah, Gus wants the NRL to go from thirteen players to twelve. Yeah. Do you know why? No. Neither just do I. Because it just. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you the same thing when I saw this. Like, why? What issue is he hoping to resolve by having this decision? Yeah. I mean, could you say he's trying to open the game up? Like, does what? it need opened up? And this is the thing. If if that's the argument, then why have we been pushing so hard to have the game closer? Yeah. And I thought people were, given the fact that subscription numbers and memberships and viewerships and crowd figures and all sorts of stuff have been steadily increasing over the last few years. Mm-hmm. That and that coincides with the competition being closer than it has ever been. Yeah. That, that was a sign that people liked the fact that competition was close. But for yeah. some reason we don't want it close. We want to have it more open so that more points are scored to make it more exciting or whatever weird reason he's got. Maybe he'd be advocating for five point tries. Yeah. Well the thing is like Three point field as, goals. Why not? Uh, yeah, three point field goals. Can you imagine that? You know what we could do? Let's just add players. Let's up the get up the points, Ooh. but we add players. What do you reckon? You put more skilled players on the field. That would make for more skilled action. One hundred percent. One bring back and bring back scrums, contested scrums. Yeah, and the extra players will make them push in the scrum too. Yeah, because that'll be exciting. I think we're starting to get a rough idea as to what Gus might be after. Mm. So 12-man 12, 12 game. Let's look at the merits and the... What's the opposite? It was, would be the opposite word for merits. Drawbacks. Did, yeah, okay. I was going to swear. Yeah. You did well. <laughs> <laughs> so Merits let's, and drawbacks. Let's go okay. with that. Let's so look merits. at the, the merits. Okay, what what do we got here? Where it's going? Okay, here's the first thing for me you're going to be spending less on players because you only got 12 in your side. You're going to be able to spend your salary cap a little better with that 12 well, players start. No way. They're not going to reduce the salary cap or the squad sizes. So I dare say players will just start demanding more money. You reckon? Yeah. But I think your starters, because your starters are obviously earn more than everyone else. They're going to just get a bigger cut of what is ever le- is left over from that extra player disappearing. Would, though, you have the risk of players getting more um, more worn out from covering more, more territory because of the, the extra space created, which yeah. then leads to more injuries, which means starting players don't play as many games anymore. Well, it would be it, this would be the death of the, a prop forward as we know. And, well, it would be the They'd death have of second rowers. Second rowers yeah. yeah, your second rowers have to be practically centres. Pretty much. Which would actually be the death of the modern centre, because your centre would then have to be... Like, Second row. Cohen Hess. Yeah. I yeah. see what you mean, yeah. Yeah. Angus Crichton, Cohen Hess. They're your, they're your modern day centres moving forward. And I don't like the thought of that. And then you'd have to have five eights who are like, let's say, Wade Graham, who are second row of five eights. Yeah. It just... <laughs> Your halfbacks that have to be pretty much hookers who can tackle really well. Jake Friends and Robbie Farris, those sort of people. Are we getting an impression here that this this updated version doesn't sound that fantastic? Yeah, it doesn't, does it? I also think when people think about, like, and it was talked about before, I remember there was one year, I think they trialled it in a, the last game of the season, and I think it was an idea that was put forward by Bob Fulton and the WOC, 
I believe they were the two people involved in pushing the idea back then. Something about old dudes like this idea. Um, and were, were they, dare I say, architects? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good <laughs> question. You, do, do you ever remember the stories about, I think it was Bob Fulton and there was a rugby union coach. He used to coach New South Wales. Dwyer was his name. And they come up with a hybrid game of rugby league and rugby union. And it was like you can play rugby league in one half of the field and then you play rugby union when the, I, you cross the line. I do remember that. And I've got a feeling that they had a, they did actually have a trial run of it. Yeah. It, two school teams or something. Yeah. And it was, uh, from memory, what happened was, it was like, it might have been the, the school t- that, uh, I think like Benji Marshall went to or something. It was a team like that. And I believe they went into the, they decided to just have a dig at the national um, schools rugby union competition and flogged everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure that that was what happened. But anyway, um, yeah, this 12, 12 side thing, I just don't see a need for it. Or like that's a fundamental change. That would be like if we changed the size of the field. Yeah, it's what is it's it's altering the fabric of the game for the sake of it. It's not actually to to achieve anything. It's not solving an issue that that's massively needing attention. And it's extremely short term thinking as well. In terms of like, you go back to the eighties, and it was a grind fest. It was a thirteen on thirteen grind fest. And you look at the game now. Or even go forward to when, just after Super League, when we had, like, you know, unlimited interchange and it was basically everyone was greyhounds almost, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, what do you think of the balance of rugby league right now in terms of attack versus defence? I'm... I don't think it's... I don't think it's been better than what it currently is. The only thing I'd want to see is the ruck cleaned up a bit. That's it. I don't know what more you need to do to focus on. You, you don't need to worry about Golden Point, as we discussed in our last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you don't need to take players off the field. You don't need to worry. I don't even think you need to start thinking about reducing the number of interchanges or, you know, having different players on the bench. There's even talk of putting a a 18th player on the bench who could be used in case you've got a HIA. I don't even know if you need to go there. Um, and if you do, then I'd make it something convoluted, say, okay, you can use your 18th man if all your other four reserves have all suffered HIAs or other injuries and can't play. Then fair enough, use an 18th man then. But that's a bit convoluted, and I'm not even convinced that that's a good idea. But that's the only thing I'd bring in in that area. Other than that, uh, clean up the ruck. That's pretty much it. I don't see that there's any huge issues that the game has anymore as far as yeah, on the field. I agree with you. I I personally like the balance of game we've got now. I think that um, if you're good enough, you can score a lot of points. If you're not, you don't get rewarded just by the, you know, the rules on the day. Um, I like where the interchange is. I think that for one of the few times I can remember having watched the game, the interchange, the influence of the interchange isn't as overbearing in terms of, how many you've got to use. So in, so it's like there's not too many. And because we've got, I mean, we've had unlimited. I think at times we've had too many interchanges allowed. I think this number is perfect right now. I've seen no reason to change it at all. I think the HIAA is an extra thing that needs to be thought about. And I I'm kind of agree with you that if we brought in an 18th man, it would have to be a real emergency uh, addition to the game. And, in an ideal world, it would be somebody that has played reserve grade earlier that day so that they weren't a fresh player, so that you weren't using it as a tactic to bring on a fresh player. But I understand we can't really do that these days with how reserve grade is run. Um, but yeah, I, I really like the balance of the game, and I think that it's it allows enough movement within the game so that tactics can dictate if the game becomes much more defensive oriented oriented, or if it opens up for whatever reason, if ter- teams are allowed to use their kicking game a lot, 
Um, that's why I don't like that uh, that rule with the seven tackles. I yeah, think that's that it, It's a disincentive, yeah, for, for having a kicking tactic. But, yeah, I really like the balance, and uh, I don't see any reason to change it. No, it's it's great as it is. Mm. Um, so, Gus, so Gus, give it a rest, man. I know yeah. you got to. I know you got to. You know, provide content for your employer, but talk about the game. Talk about some tactics. We love it when you talk. Like, take us behind the scenes with coaching and tell us about tactics. We love that. Don't do the yeah. clickbaity stuff. Genuine analysis. Yeah. Get back to that. That's what you're good at. That's your strength. Stop yeah. being, as, as an old quote says, stop being bitter, just get better. Ooh, I've never heard that before. Mm. There you go. Um, one last little tidbit of news. Mm-hmm. Something light to turn the episode. The NRL is on the verge of securing the legendary Tina Turner to once again become the face, voice, and big spiky hair of the game, says Andrew Webster, who has no hair. <laughs> <laughs> Next season, oh, this is going to make a lot of people feel old. Next season will mark 30 years since Turner Simply the Best became League's enduring anthem. Okay, I'm not going to read much more than that. I feel old already. But, uh, yeah, what do you think about Tina Turner coming back? First of all, I think we need to put in an edit point. We don't edit our podcast, but we need an edit point to get rid of that 30-year thing because <laughs> that is horrifying. That That, that is. Um, That's horrible, man. Yeah. Wow. 30 years. We just had a little mental crisis there between the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you. Oh. Um, anyway, so she's <laughs> going to be 80 next year, which is one, I guess, issue. Are they, um, it, I, now, when she came out here in the 1990s, okay, she was yeah. dubbed the sexiest grandmother of rock and roll. Yeah. Will she now come out and be the sexiest great-grandmother of rock and roll? <laughs> 30 years, yes, yeah, she could be, hey. Oh, Imagine my that. goodness. She's oh. going to be, she, she like, I'd, I'd be shocked if she, she sung it. I would love to know if she's still got the lungs, whether she can belt it out still. I can't imagine she can. I mean, she's 80. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the idea is here. Like, to me, going back and rehashing something that was, that was successful, to me, is a sign that you've run out of ideas. See, I I like the the idea behind it, right? But I think in in practice, it's not going to be what they what they want is nineteen ninety Tina Turner to walk out and belt yeah. it out, and it's like, yeah, this is incredible. But, but she's eighty, man. But the thing is, that song was popular in the eighties and nineties because that's when she released it. So that was what the that's what the kids were listening to. Kids today have not grown up listening to that song. And if they have, it's in the, this is going to sound horrible again, it's in the retro section at JB Hi-Fi. Can you just stop that, please? I'm sorry. I'm having a crisis here. <laughs> True. You know, so thought... it's, it's not a common song. See, I think what they want to do is yeah. just go, you know what, let's get a band that plays loud music. Mm-hmm. A band that's popular, everyone knows it, and get them out here and say, you know what, We'll give you a million bucks. You play us a theme song, something that's, you know, a rehash of probably one of your own songs, or just do one song that you think is close to ours. Mm-hmm. Bang, put it out there. Have, use it for two years. Get that, get them out, get them that band to come out and they can play it State of Origin 1, 2, or 3, or maybe all 3 and whatever else. Just do something like that and just stick with the band for one or two years. Bring in a bit of consistency, but something with some energy. See, my I've said this for a number of years now. Just drop five million, get Beyonce to sing it, just do it. Everyone will love it. Every sport that's not rugby league in Australia will bloody be kicking themselves and saying, Ah no. Look at this moment they've created. Ah, damn it. I think that would be incredible. I look, I don't know other singers that you could get out to sing it because you'd have to get someone with a really strong voice. Um, I think you've got to get a female to sing it. I think that it's it's a song that's great when it's sung by a female. I wasn't a big fan of Jimmy Barnes singing it. Um, so I'm sure there are other women that would be able to, to do it, but I think Beyonce would just hammer it out. And, yeah, she's going to she's gonna cost a lot of money. 
but I think you'd get a return. And, uh, you know, I, I think it'd be sensational. It would be. Mm. It would be. Um, in lieu of that, we could just get, we could just get League Freaks read some poetry. What if, right, what if, for coming up of grand final day, I put together a rugby league poem and I... I sort of say it in the same way that Trent Barrett did his lead into that season when they saved their money and they did no promotion whatsoever. Oh, God, this has to happen. Yeah. We'll please, do it. Lord, make, please, Lord, make that happen. Should, I, should a poem, should it rhyme or can I be like... Poetry those... doesn't have to rhyme. Okay, cool. Has, something's just got a bit of rhythm to it. It doesn't have to rhyme. As I tell okay. you. That that's probably just made things more complicated for you. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll work something out. I'll show you how creative. I'll get my creative juices flowing. Well, many years ago, I actually won fifteen dollars in a poetry writing contest in a tiny country town. Okay, Andrew. I can't even. I cannot even remember what it was. D- don't bullshit me now. Okay. I know you keep this shit. What was it about? And <laughs> no. where you've got it, you've got it somewhere. Don't fucking bullshit me, man. What was it? I no, I literally do not know. I, I, I generally the way I used to write it was I just sit down and go write a line, going okay, what rhymes with that? Write that down, write that down, write that down. And a lot of the times it was it was um, rather miserable stuff. I don't know what it was. Really, I must have been going through a phase. We we a bit emo, <laughs> were you? No, it wasn't emo. I think it was just more pissed off. Just angry. <laughs> yeah, just angry. I was, I, was a, I, was a, I was a rage poet. A rage poet. Remember when people used to do that slam poetry? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't into that too much. Man, people like that are why flamethrowers were introduced into the world. That's right. Jeez. <laughs> No, I used to get pissed off over over stupid things like um, people not singing the anthem at footy, and so I get the shits over it and write, try and write it down something constructive. And I thought it'd be good if I did that in poetry for some reason. And I yeah. look at it and I go, "Yeah, that was wow, that's bad." See, I've <laughs> got to think. I've got to think of something to put together for uh, the grand final. So to be like, I don't know, like it's a rugby league fate. There's pizza on my plate. No See, I'm time thinking, for debate. I'm, Maybe I'm I'll it's just got to have some. Oh. It's got to have some corny references. Corny references. Yeah, you got to have it. It's like really, really. See, whenever you're trying to do something that's poetry related with football, mm-hmm. it's always hard to make it so it doesn't sound like it's some sort of thing that a twelve-year-old wrote. What rhymes with Parramatta? <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't. It doesn't matter. I'm watching actually, Parramatta. Actually, you know what? What? I have written a piece of rugby league poetry. Oh, yes! Yes! And... All right. Let me take my pants off. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to find it now. Yeah, you look for it, right? What would be... Um... It's in a different format, though. What do you mean? Well... The first line had like 10 words, then the next one had 9, then 8, then 7, then 6, and 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Then it went back out, all the way up to 10, and back down again. So when you what saw it on the page, hell? it went like a weird zigzag thing. And it was... Uh, okay. I think, you're, I think you're opening up here about a part of your life that you've really locked away from everyone. And I think that we're about to uncover yeah. some just this is, gold. This is, written, this is written in 2009. Okay. I won't recite it on here. I'll I'll, make, I'll leave a, a link for it. But it was it was about that try that Mark Coyne scored in the state of origin. Oh Jesus! <laughs> and it's yeah. a it's a mix of what happened on the field, yeah, the commentary that was said in there, yeah, and the crowd reactions all thrown into one. Okay. All right, now, I I support you in this. I support all of your creative stuff. But there's going to be times it's going to sound like I'm laughing hysterically or that I'm ridiculing you. And I promise you I'm not. You know I'm not, all right? So so go on, start us off. So it starts off long, 
and each sentence gets smaller, but then it goes out again. Oh, hang on, you've sent me the link. Do you want me I'll to? Do you, want, do you want me to write read it out? Just, just you just have a look at it and tell me what you think of the of the start of it. See if you think it's if it's yeah. any good because it doesn't have. I don't think it's a traditional thing where you see a lot of rhyming. You'll see what I mean by the the structure of it. It's sort of waves in and out. It's designed to be like that to sort of build tension in the middle. Okay, I like it. Yeah, it's not bad actually. I get it. This is pretty good. Are you gonna, do you want to read it out? Or me? No. Me? No, you, you can if me? you want. Okay. okay. This is Poetry in Motion by Andrew <laughs> Ferguson. The last throw of the dice. All or nothing. Coin at the 79th minute is tackled. Everyone on the edge of their seat. All are hopeful. All crossing fingers, but for two different outcomes, coin plays the ball. 12 to 10. The score line. Now, Meninga. Dummy half. Players scattered everywhere. He passes to Langer. Everyone's eyes fixated on him. Langer pushing it wide. Walters onwards. Each pass filled with trepidation and hope. Half the crowd are overcome with looming concern, while the other half start to get very excited. The heart begins to race. Normality is pushed aside. Khan joins in, floats the pass to Renoff. He swiftly turns to catch the pass. In one motion, he sets off, the crowd sensing something ominous. Some cover their eyes. Others stand up to see Renoff looking for opportunity. Any small chance, as he does the crowd, they begin to make noise. Adrenaline begins pumping even more now. They know Renoff can score from anywhere. He spots an opportunity. He wastes no time. Renoff down the touchline, beats one, gets it infield. Renoff's speed eluded him from David Barnhill's desperate clutches. He passes back inside as Wishar tackles him. Hancock is heavily tackled just after receiving. As he gets driven backwards, ruthlessly, he manages to find support. Hancock gets it on! They aren't quitting. Not yet. No. Smith backs up. Keeps it alive. Queensland are coming back. Blues fans fearing the worst. Maroon's fans' confidence continues to build as Darren Smith saunters across the field, keeping his options open while looking for support. Blue faces frowning. They can't believe their eyes. Blue panic begins running wild. This can't be happening. Maroon's faces grow more excited. They smell victory. The Blues players tired, exhausted and sore, never giving up, continue to defend. The Maroons continue pressing on. Darren Smith for Langer. Langer in space. He's through. Langer, caught. Falling forwards, he looks around. Langer gets it away. He passes to his right. Blues defence comes swarming down the field. Finally realising the game is still alive. The play has travelled from left to right. And now the Maroons are only 20 metres out. Every player exhausted. Desperate. Hopeful, yet trying damn hard. To ensure victory for their team and themselves. They are all oblivious to the scoreboard. It's now or never for all. Langer's pass floats to Meninga. Here's the big fella, running with purpose, with power, intent, tackled by Mackay, looks for support, gets the pass on. They have come 40 metres, there is only 5 metres left. Every person is on their feet now. Despair, hope, glory, tragedy, excitement, suspense, victory, failure. 
all running wild through every single fan and player. Now, one has taken a breath for a minute. No one has taken a breath for a minute, sorry. Not one single person has blinked an eyelid. The Maroons are near the left sideline. There are no more options left. Down to one last man on his last play to seal fate. That man, coin, coin, did he? No one knows. There's no way, not a chance in hell. Coin is grabbed around the waist. Fitler hanging on. Coin steps back infield. Ricky Stewart is there to defend his line. Coin is falling forward. Stewart hunches down as well. Preparing himself as much as possible against the attack. Coin is almost on the ground. No hope. Ben Elias comes running over to assist. Blues players have appeared from nowhere. Coin reaches out for glory. Goes for the corner. His arm free. Finds freedom. Victory. Unbelievable. Tiny gap. Grounds the ball. And gets the try. Queensland. It's a miracle performance. The try is awarded. Queensland wins. The pa- the patient siren sounds in the background. Blues fans are aghast at what just happened. For 79 minutes, they were never in doubt. The mighty Queensland spirit never waned for a second. Disappointment wasn't going to be wearing maroon today. Blues fans and players are quiet, unbelieving, while the maroons fans jump emphatically. Their players embrace one another, proud of that feat, of their heroes, these men, legends, tenacious, it subsides. Euphoria reigns supreme. That's not a try, the immortal words of Ray. That's a miracle, he excitedly proclaims. The never-say-die spirit grew stronger. All those years of beating from the blues making this emphatic and miraculous victory even more sweeter. Well done, Andrew. <laughs> that was very good. There you go. It drags on a bit. I think I think Ray's commentary was a bit quicker. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> I, 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 did, I didn't have some water. I needed a drink halfway through that. <laughs> uh, That's a long a, poem, actually. Yeah, it's I, about, about 740-odd words or so. I read. Really? Yeah. yeah. I thought palms were shorter than that, but I, I don't know. I'm not a poet. No, I break the rules. Yeah. In the poetry <laughs> world. There, there was no even rhyming with that. I just, just I just decided to make my own poetry rule, and that is each line has one word less than the other until it got down to one. I just went, go back out again. Yeah, no, it was good. I like it. It's really good. That's a really good poem about that State of Origin game. Like, I'm not even just saying that. I really think it's good. There you go. See, uni- universal qualities as a writer. I can do anything. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. That's fantastic. You should write more rugby league poetry. You could do a book of rugby league poetry. If I was to do that, I'd make them all much shorter. Like maybe <laughs> two or three paragraphs. Yeah. Or maybe, actually, I think something would probably suit my style. I'd just write rugby league limericks. <laughs> <laughs> there was a man from Nantucket. <laughs> <laughs> What ones could you, who could you, I imagine doing a poem about Gutherson. It's just a shame his name doesn't rhyme real well. Real well. There was a name called Clint. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I, I couldn't write that one. There you go. <laughs> uh, no, I was going to say, I was going to finish that. Uh, I can't. No. No. So, that was a rather artistic way to end the episode. That really was. Maybe we could, uh, we should get people to send in rugby league poems to us. That's and, a brilliant uh, idea. Yeah, why not? Send them to podcast at leaguefreak dot com, and uh, if you've got a good rugby league poem that you'd like us to read out on air, yeah, we could. Um, I can read one out. You could read one out, and we could probably yeah. even take a photo of the best one. Yeah, and it's being it's got the the freaky's hammer sitting on top of it. Yeah, I just lay my hammer across it. That'd yeah. be good. Job done. Yeah, just right there, bang. That's the stamp of approval right there. Pretty much. There you go. People want to do that? That'd be a great idea. 
Yeah, yeah, let's do it. All right. So, um, thanks for tuning in for this episode. Um, it, we didn't know where it was going to go. No. Definitely didn't expect it to go there. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you had said to me at the start, you know what, you're going to read a 700-word poem. <laughs> I said, no, not happening, man. Not happening. If, if you had written it, I, I'd read your poems, Andrew. Yeah, well, that's the only one I've got on there. Okay. I'll come up with one for the next show. Don't worry. All right. Well, that's that's the bar. Yeah. Okay. Oh, don't worry. I will exceed it. I am not worried at all. I Let's be honest. I've left the door wide open because um, I've left you to do one that, just, that has rhyming because I didn't use any. Maybe. Do you reckon I should do one about British Rugby League? Ooh. Oh, I think that it's could, probably a good one, eh? That could get a bit sweary. No, I, and I promise not to swear in it. How about that? Okay, and there'd be okay. no, there'd be no casual racism. If this uh, what would be racist? <laughs> it's no need to be racist. Though. It's it's xenophobia, as I've said before. It's not racist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, that was being a bit uh, flimsy there, I guess, in my definition. It's all right. <laughs> I was trying to put tough parameters on there to see see what you could do under pressure. Yeah, try and keep me like in a in a very small box in terms yeah. of what I can and cannot say. That's right. Like, um, okay, you can do one on the British Rugby League, but it's got to be trying to talk the game up like you're trying to sell it to a broadcaster. Oh, no, nah, come on, man. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to be. I'm going to be honest. How about that? <laughs> That's fine. I say go for it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, yeah. Go on, you got, go on you got because one. we all enjoyed that poem. Go to Andrew's Patreon and just donate a dollar for listening to the poems that he did because it was a good poem. I liked it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, if I, if I meet my goal, I'll write another one. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. I like that premise. You can do one about, uh, what's another one? Maybe ben, lock Benji's, Benji's Flick. Yeah, Benji's Flick Pass. Yeah, that's the next one. Okay. Oh. And my palms are free. <laughs> they're, they're worth it. <laughs> they're worth every cent. <laughs> I'm not sure mine are that much better, to be honest, but there you go. Um, all right, everyone, thanks for tuning in, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time. <laughs>